ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats, and uh, so with that we, we can get started. Private conversations later. <laughs> Well, I, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. My name is Dimitri Dafilu. Uh, I, uh, I teach at Kadir Has University in Istanbul, and uh, I'm honored and privileged uh, to be moderating the session on Can Turkey uh, Bridge a Gap Between Asia and Europe? And we have a very distinguished panel uh, to discuss this topic with us. Let me briefly introduce them. Uh, starting on my immediate uh, left, uh, Dr. Artis Pabrix, the Deputy Prime Minister for the EU Presidency and the Defense Minister of Latvia. Next to him is uh, Yashar Yakis, the former Foreign Minister of uh, Turkey, who we had uh, the privilege of listening to last night. Uh, next to him, Mr. Christian Schmidt, the Parliamentary State Secretary to the Federal Minister of Defense, the German Federal Minister of Defense. And uh, our last panelist is uh, Mr. Grigol Vashadze, the Foreign Minister of Georgia. Uh, this is a hot topic. Uh, you know, we, if one is, uh, it's both important, timely, topical, and much debated in policy and academic circles. If one lives in Turkey, as I do, uh, one gets the feeling that Turkey is at the center of the world. Uh, its neighbors are a varied bunch of countries, with some like Syria and Iraq in particular, very much at the limelight for not necessarily the right reasons. Uh, there is uh, the, 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 still the ongoing uh, Kurdish insurgency in, in Turkey, which, where there are tensions that have been rising recently. There are tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean, in particular, uh, the tensions, the differences between Turkey and Israel and its implications. In the Eastern Mediterranean, too, there are other issues that have come up, issues that have to do with exclusive economic zones, drilling for gas, uh, the limits of the exclusive economic zone, the legality of drilling, uh, because the Republic of Cyprus and Israel are involved in it, and, and Turkey is not particularly happy with this. There's also the Arab Spring. And uh, this week, uh, you know, Prime Minister Erdogan was paying high-level, very high-profile visits to Egypt, Tunisia, and uh, Libya uh, all, all this week. And there was a lot of press, and there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Turkey and its role. Turkey is the world's largest, 15th largest or 16th largest economy with aspirations to be uh, one of the top 10 economies by 2023 when Turkey will be commemorating the 100th year of the founding of the Turkish Republic. Uh, and the project is that by 2023, Turkey would have a $2 trillion US dollars economy. Uh, there's also internally, domestically, within Turkey, a tug of war. Uh, between elites, in so within society. Uh, we have a government that's been in power, uh, that has been in power for almost 10 years, and there is a tug of war for the heart and soul of Turkey among, between the secular elites that use, in a way, to be running the country, and the new elites, uh, and, 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 and their conservative conservatism on some issues. And, and so one has to see where this goes. There is a whole issue about the military uh, and, and ongoing trials and uh, a number of high, high level military figures in jail for uh, participation, the alleged participation in, in uh, the Organicon trial, among others. There is an issue now also about changing the constitution. Uh, Turkey's constitution uh, dates back to 1980. Uh, was written by the military elite, and there's a whole debate about creating a democratic constitution for democratic Turkey. <coughs> and that, too, is an ongoing debate as to what sort of constitution would be written. Uh, and linked to that is also the whole issue about whether one should change or not uh, 
the system, the, the political system that we've set up, go more to a presidential system or not. One cannot deny that Tayyip Erdogan is a leader. Uh, uh, there are debates about what sort of leader he is. Uh, one foreign observer not too long ago at a meeting had said, this was last year, last November, I think, when he, the, the Prime Minister had visited Lebanon, uh, and his comment was that uh, Erdogan acts like a national leader on the international sta stage, in the comment being, and this is uh, one of the criticisms, that many of the things that he's doing uh, is actually always addressed to his electorate to his constituency back home, and that there is no vision necessarily as to what the foreign policy objectives are. Is this necessarily the case? Uh, on the other hand, there's also in, in evidence lesser and lesser use of, in rhetorically at least, of the words West and NATO, okay? even though we have the Assistant Secretary General of NATO with us, in, in, in the language of uh, uh, high-level officials, even though next year Turkey will be celebrating its 60th, 60th anniversary uh, of entry into NATO. In uh, 2000, 2013, uh, Turkey will be, well, it will be commemorating the 50th anniversary also of the signing of the An Ankara Agreement, which is really the official start of relations with the European Union. So it's very interesting, the question that is being asked about whether Turkey can be a bridge uh, between Europe and Asia. Well, we still have to define Asia, even though we are, we are pretty clear from the questions in the program what we mean by Asia, in this sense. Uh, whether it can do this, whether it wants to do this, whether this is plausible. So I'll just give the floor to our uh, speakers for very brief interventions before we get into a question and answer and I'd like to begin with you Minister Yashar uh, Yakish on to say a few things um, about the question at hand. Thank you very much Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri and I we are very great friends since a very long time. We are member of the forum which is called Turkish Greek Forum which meets regularly in Athens, in Ankara, Istanbul, or in Cyprus. And uh, at the end of the, this month, we are going to meet in the neutral zone in Cyprus again. And I'm very happy that uh, Dimitri agreed to uh, teach in a Turkish university so that Turkish students could also benefit from his wisdom and uh, also he could see and watch and observe what is taking place in Turkey very closely. And his introductory remarks showed to what extent he grasped every single detail regarding Turkey. And I will not be able to say as eloquently as he has done uh, uh, this picture depicting what Turkey uh, is doing or could do. Now, coming to the subject, can Turkey bridge a gap between Asia and Europe? The short answer to this question is no, Turkey cannot bridge uh, between Asia and Europe, depending upon what we, are, we mean, because I do not know what it means uh, when we say Asia. Europe, we may understand to a certain extent, because you could replace the word Europe with the EU in many cases, and it is understood. But if we are talking of the Asian continent, including China, Japan, and all other countries, then Turkey cannot uh, bridge between uh, Europe and Asia. This is the short answer. But longer answer, there is a, a medium-sized answer and long answer, uh, the other answer is that when we, close, when we look at Turkey more closely, uh, as uh, Dimitri said, every country has the right to look at itself as the epicenter of the world. And it, I wouldn't claim that Turkey also looks at itself as the epicenter of the world, but try to figure out where Turkey is located in the world map. And... Uh, take a compass and put one leg of the compass in Istanbul and draw a circle that goes up to London, Middle East, and some part of Africa and Russia, etc. 
the circle that covers uh, that part of the world, you cannot obtain any other spot in the world where you draw a circle with the epicenter other places and which covers as many problem areas or critical areas in the world as it is in Turkey. So I don't say that it is epicenter of, uh, of the world, but it is a center which is close to many things that happens in the vicinity, in the immediate neighborhood. What is this immediate neighborhood? Middle East, Caucasus, Balkans, and the Central Asia. In all of these four areas, we'll Turkey has now. some sort of presence. In the Middle East, because of the neighborhood, an Ottoman legacy, that's to say these countries were part of the Ottoman Empire. Was it long ago? Well, if there are anyone here who is about 90 years old, everyone who was born 90 years ago were born as Ottoman citizens in this geography. Which geography is this? all the way from Yemen, Saudi Arabia, all the uh, Gulf countries, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, etc., Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, and Libya. Everyone who was born 90 years ago and who are at present alive, they were born as Ottoman citizens. That's to say, we had the same citizenship with these people. And the present population of these countries also includes north of Greece, Macedonia, and Albania, and the citizens, the present citizens of all these countries are children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren of these people. So we have a close relations because of this. And as a result of this, as again, as a result of Ottoman legacy, we, we accommodate at present more Albanians in Turkey than in Albania itself. More Bosnians, there are more Bosnians in Turkey than in Bosnia Herzegovina itself. There are more Georgians in Turkey than in Georgia. There are more Abkhazians in Turkey than in Abkhazia. What does it make? This establishes a sort of communication that you can communicate easily with these people, with the wrong side and bad side, uh, good side, but you can communicate. This is how Turkey was successful, for instance, in bringing together uh, the parts of the conflict dispute in Bosnia, something that many European countries were not able to do. In Syria, we have longest border with Syria, something like seven or eight hundred uh, kilometers. There are divided families. There are Syrians who own real estate in Turkey and, this, uh, and the Turks owning real estate in, in Syria. So it is very close relations. But is, it, is everything good? No, it is not. Ottoman legacy I, I happen to be the longest serving diplomat in the Middle Eastern countries. It's not like we were taught at school that the Ottomans brought peace and stability throughout the centuries in the Middle East. The people there regard the Ottoman legacy more with the negative side of it. In Syrian school books, it says the darkest period in the Syrian history is Ottoman period. So people are taught that way. To what extent it was uh, true, I do not know. I remember when I was serving there, an old friend of mine used to tell me, in 1930s, we were at school, our teacher, after having taught that the darkest period of Ottoman history, of Syrian history is the Ottoman uh, period, he used to close the book and he used to say, Children, 
I served as a teacher. I taught in, in the Ottoman period, and I am teaching now in 1930s. The Ottoman, this is the official position of the official curriculum, that it is darker spirit, but I, I was a teacher at that time, and uh, uh, I know that the Ottoman period is not like the one which is described in this book. So um, the reality may vary from one side to the other, but the short, the middle-sized answer is that Turkey has constraints in bridging this, this gap, so in bridging between uh, Europe and Turkey. Could it do it anything? Yes, it could do. It could do it better together with Europe, together with the Atlantic transatlantic cooperation, something that it could not do alone. It could do it better by cooperating with Europe and transatlantic cooperation. Same thing applies to the European Union and the United States Atlantic community. That's to say, Europe and the United States could do everything that they want in this geography alone without cooperating with Turkey. But by cooperating with Turkey, it could achieve the same task with lesser financial resources, with lesser human resources, with lesser acrimony, and more efficiently. So this is what I want to say to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I pass the floor to the other speakers, I also want to say welcome to the young, dip uh, young diplomacy professionals and others watching us online. Uh, and I wait the questions from our internet audience. Uh, I also want to say Yasha Yakish is a very interesting uh, person in the sense that not only was he foreign minister, but he just said he was the longest serving Turkish diplomat in the Middle East, and also the only Turkish diplomat that, and the first and only Turkish diplomat that joined the AKP party, uh, which is also an interesting... A founding member. A founding member, as you, you said it very well yesterday too. Uh, I'd like to pass the floor to the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, uh, sir. Yes, thank you very much <coughs> for this opportunity. First of all, I think that there's really need for this and such panels because uh, I think at least in our region, I don't know about the rest of the European Union, uh, we are discussing the importance of uh, Turkey and uh, Turkish global influence too less and people understand it too less. And because we have only a little bit more than one hour left, I will uh, as now representative of uh, Defense Ministry, I will drop all the niceties and try to be very straight and provocative. And um, if uh, we are speaking about Turkey uh, in general, that I think that this is a very good example of general pattern in uh, European and world politics, in European politics uh, as far as uh, the enlargement of EU and NATO, namely uh, these politics are very full with stereotypes. And once we speak about stereotypes in international relations, I think when we are mentioning uh, here uh, the word Turkey, we can discuss a number of them. Uh, before I'm trying to explain this, I will, I will try first to give a, also a very brief answer to the question, can Turkey bridge the gap? Uh, first of all, again, it depends on the definition. If we understand that the other side of this um, place where we have to construct the bridge is so-called Arab world and uh, countries of uh, former Ottoman Empire, then I think that Turkey is a very good contributor. Obviously, for historic reasons, there can be a better success and in some occasions maybe not so good success. But yes, Turkey has an understanding, they have an expertise, and what we are seeing uh, now and, 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 and these days also from uh, the visits of uh, Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, this is exactly what starts probably slowly to work. The second question, uh, what we need to answer in order to find an answer for the first question is, can we in European Union, and I'm not speaking here about Europe, but about European Union, can we actually ourselves uh, bridge the gap between Europe and Turkey? And here I think we can distinguish maybe two issues, what we Latvians or what we both also experience when we have been 
uh, on our way to join European Union. Namely, there are rational reasons for uh, support or skepsis for Turkish membership, and there are subjective reasons, uh, or I would say stereotypical reasons. If we, I start with the second part, then one of the, one of the arguments, of what you probably know, is that, okay, Turkey is not a Christian country, and even if many politicians do not pronounce this, uh, this uh, openly, then frequently in, in, in discussions, this is frequently mentioned. There is some kind of cultural difference. My immediate argument uh, for provoking this discussion more is that, that I think it's totally wrong. First of all, we see the European Union as a secular unity. That's number one. Secondly, uh, if we are studying history, that we know that the differences uh, between uh, Christianity, Judaism, and um, Islam actually is not so big. Uh, thirdly, if we just speculate with our history, just imagine the situation that uh, in uh, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, the Reconquista in Spain would not succeed. There might be a Muslim country. Or imagine that during the Crusades, some Christian countries might stay in the Middle East. So where, where actually are these, these, these cultural borders, even if, if we think that this is important? I personally think it's not important. It should not influence our politics because we are speaking about secular countries and division between the religion on one side and uh, politics on the other side. And here comes the Turkey, which actually um, is the only country um, in a full understanding of the world which have so-called uh, value background um, which is maybe from the same group as Christianity and Judaism, but still the only country which could, after the Ataturk reforms, to divide secular country from the religion. So here we are actually seeing that uh, Turkey uh, is developing in 20th century exactly according to the uh, manner of uh, many other European countries. And keep into account that even if, if most of European EU countries are, are secular countries, some officially did not divide religion from the state. In fact, if you're looking to Scandinavian countries, these are monarchies where, where, where state religion is still, still mentioned there. But this, this is, this is a, if you go in details. So I think this is one of the stereotypes which cannot influence our decisions when we are speaking about the accession. The other issue is, is so-called rational approach. Turkey is a big country. What will happen to European Union when such a big country will, will, will enter, etc.? Uh, first of all, we have legal issues where we started with this, uh, uh, when we um, started the um, accession talks with Turkey, and so we have to keep to our promises. Secondly, uh, secondly uh, my personal understanding is, looking now to the Euro crisis, looking to the internal crisis in the European Union, that uh, EU needs actually a very strong internal reform. If we are not, uh, let's say, giving up because of fatigue of the enlargement, if we are not giving up because uh, of our inability to reconstruct ourselves, to reinvent the European Union, to make it stronger, then we should, as soon as possible, proceed with uh, accession talks uh, regarding Turkey because Turkey, in a positive way, can be a very good facilitator of those many reforms which the EU needs. Because until there is no this challenge from outside, until there is no crisis in, in Greece or United States or somewhere else, nobody wants to reform because everything is fine. Once there is a crisis, we start to think what to do. Do we need a euro bonds? Do we need a more federal Europe? Again, this discussion comes up. So I see this as a positive thing, looking also from my country's experience in yesterday's uh, examples of our Prime Minister, if we would not have this crisis, we would not reconstruct our, our economic structure. We did it, we are now more competitive. I think EU can become more competitive if it bridges its gap with Turkey, if uh, Turkey becomes a member of the European Union, so we can become a stronger. The last, uh, I, know, I know that there is a lot of issues and I just wanted to, to provoke them more for, for this discussion. But the last uh, issue uh, regarding um, precisely the, the name of our topic. Uh, in 21st century, European Union is struggling in the world not so much about the internal peace. 
in Europe, between France or Germany or between Catholics or Protestants or whatever, but we are struggling about our competitiveness, sustainability and actually influence in the world. Can we as a European Union succeed without radical reforms and can we really succeed without Turkey? I think it will be much more difficult. Second, one of the biggest challenges for our world security and also for Europe is coming from radicals in certain Arab countries, from unresolved Middle East issues, uh, from unresolved also, in this case, Cyprus question. If we are keeping Turkey out, then there will be this bridge between Europe and Middle East and Arab countries, but the guard of this bridge might look in a different direction. We want that this guard, I want precisely, that this guard is standing on the European side. And we should use all that momentum and all that capability that Turkey can offer to the European continent to uh, try to solve this challenge which uh, openly for our public started on 11th of September, but uh, actually causes, of course, we know, have been much deeper. I will stop now, but I'll be happy to um, in be engaged in a, in a more vivid discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, you talked about the EU and uh, Turkey. I'm reminded of the latest transatlantic trends report that just came out and had a very interesting figure when it came to Turkey and the EU. So 48% of the Turks, of Turkish public, see membership in the EU as a good thing. Although uh, it used to be 73% of course in 2004, but 48% see it as a good thing, while 33% think it will not happen. And there is an inverse tendency in Europe, which is very interesting. In Europe, only 26% see it as a good thing, but according to the poll, 53% think it will happen. Uh, which is very interesting too. Uh, it, it might be interpreted, in fact, as, you know, there's an accession process, always leads somewhere. Europeans do not like successive enlargements, but they accept the fact that it's happening. So it's interesting, and maybe we can talk about this later. I'd like now to give the floor to, to Minister Vashadze, uh, representing Georgia, a country neighboring Turkey. Uh, and also, uh, maybe in your remarks, you can also address the issue of, I mean, we talk about Turkey's neighborhoods, there's a lot of movement in the southern neighborhood. You come from, well, from the European the eastern neighborhood, so Turkey's northern neighborhood, where there are things the same or is there more of a status quo uh, approach, also given the fact that uh, Russia is another one of your neighbors? Sir. Uh, Dimitri, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll, be, I'll try to be very short and leave as much time for questions and answers as possible. Let's start with uh, Georgian-Turkish bilateral uh, relationship, which I should say is close to exemplary. We are strategic allies, enough said. Uh, and if you think about Turkey playing a role of the bridge, I, I, I'm reluctant to answer the question, can Turkey play the role of the bridge between Europe and Asia? But when it comes to South and Caucasus, to Caspian region, and then farther to Central Asia, Turkey is already playing a role of the bridge together with Georgia and Azerbaijan. I would like to remind to this distinguished audience uh, existence of three pipelines, uh, two of them uh, oil pipelines and then one gas pipeline. Nabucco, which uh, finally, I think, is going, going to, to be uh, taken uh, from the shelf and taken from the shelf and brought to, to, <coughs> to reality and uh, railway which is going to be operational in 2012 railway between Azerbaijan, Georgia and Turkey and uh, which will start from delivering 10 million tons of cargo uh, from Asia to Europe. So my answer is absolutely yes and uh, Turkey is playing incredibly important role as the locomotion of the economic progress in our region. Uh, if you, if you think specifically about Georgia, uh, Tur we shall be thanking Turkey for, for, for regaining our independence and actually keeping it. Because when Russia introduced embargo, everybody mistakenly thinks that Russia introduced the embargo in 2006. Nonsense. We've been embargoed since the beginning of the 90s. And Turkey, for 
uh, three of South and Caucasian states used to be a window to the rest of the world because all other communications were cut off. Um, <clears throat> Turkey is number one trade partner of Georgia. We have visa-free regime. Even more so, uh, citizens of two countries can cross the border with internal documents, with just identity card. Uh, we have deep free trade agreement. We have common aviation space. And uh, we are absolutely happy that Turkish role in our region is not diminished. You asked me this question before, before we started our, our panel. The Turkey, but this, please remember that this is welcome presence in our region at least when it comes to Georgia and Azerbaijan. And it differs drastically from Russian presence, which is imposed upon by military means. Turkey can dictate conditions, but Tur Turkey never does that, at least when it comes to Ge Georgia, because they respect our sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and our rights. So our relationship is not elder and younger, or, or, or bigger and smaller. It is two partners which respect each other. Uh, do we not have problems at all? Nonsense. Of course we do. We have divergences. We have uh, bitter arguments. So there are problems where we have different approaches. But uh, what we are doing is trying to resolve those divergences with civilized dialogue. There are working groups on each and every problematic question. Um, what is the future? Of, of Turkey's presence in Southern Caucasus, broader in our region, and, and, and uh, when it comes to being in between uh, Asia and Europe. I think the answer is evident. Turkey is a secular democracy, which can be extremely important for peace, security, stability, and development. And the quicker Everybody understands that the better for, uh, Europe, for the European Union, Middle East, Southern Caucasus, Central Asia. Uh, you might ask me, are you standing for Turkey's full-fledged membership with, w when it comes to the European Union? Yes. Politically, militarily, uh, geostrategically, and egoistically, I stand for that. So, uh, I think it's enough uh, for the time being. I'll be waiting for the questions. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to give the floor to Christian Schmidt. And I mean, in your remarks, if you can also say a few things, uh, given also your defense background in particular, whether, I mean, how could Turkey and Europe, the EU, Turkey and the West, work uh, much more close in the defense field? I mean, you know, some of the questions we've been asked here have to do about Turkey knocking on the EU's door and the long delayed membership process. And uh, are there ways of further enhancing relations? Trade relations are undisputed. It's about 50% uh, of uh, the trade between uh, Turkey's trade with the EU, and then the rest of the world comes along. But in other ways of enhancing this, at least on the defense side? Thank you very much. Um, um, I think uh, defense is one of the uh, most um, unproblematic uh, Relation, fields of relation, as um, just um, I'm personally when I I made my first trip as a as a, a young representative of a political youth organization to Turkey, I remember my then chairman of my party, Franz Josef Strauss, said, and never forget, those are the Turkish friends are the uh, <laughs> southeastern flank of NATO. And uh, uh, this is one key partner. So this was, um, uh, was in these times. Up to now, Turkey is a very reliable partner in NATO, the second uh, largest provider to NATO after the US and uh, 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 close to Germany. We have uh, good experiences in cooperation uh, in mission, be it in Kosovo. Uh, albeit um, uh, in, in other NATO missions, including Afghanistan. So I think there could be, this is the, the good part. The problematic part is just coming because uh, we have not yet managed to uh, converge the uh, NATO commitment into European Union defense commitment. Why? So now 
your very first year in politics. If you see what brings us, makes it so complicated to have uh, a NATO EU consent in security policy missions or affairs. Um, the, this is a uh, uh, Turkish position and Cyprus, uh, the uh, coming presidency of the European Union has a lot to do and to work to show that uh, we are and uh, especially uh, Cyprus is interested in bringing NATO and European Union defense and security policy closer together. But if I just may um, add about um, uh, the very interesting distinction uh, Artis has made about uh, rational reasons and uh, uh, subjective reasons, uh, whether we talk about what the role of Turkey would be. I, I would start from this flank of NATO approach, uh, which brought us to an, uh, a, an attempt of integration in the 60s and now uh, in a time when we see that our economic integration has uh, increased to a political integration, uh, the challenges which are uh, behind such an approach. So I uh, think, I, I agree, we do not talk about just a uh, bridge instead of flank. Uh, and bridge could be between, we will say, your neighborhood, the Islamic world, um, those who have, uh, as you said, were bearer of the same passport um, uh, in if they would be 90 years or older today, um, and a little bit more. So uh, um, I do not see that we should just take Turkey as a bridge, uh, but see that Turkey could contribute with a special position, a special history, to a larger entity as uh, Europe uh, uh, could do as itself. I would like to compare it a little bit to the um, Spanish approach to try to, to bridge somehow uh, to the Hispanic-speaking world, especially uh, in Southern America and Latin America, which does not mean that Spain would set outside Europe but it's going beyond Europe. And so I would understand what is, uh, uh, there are, uh, in the, if, if we just put the intention of having a full integration status of Turkey as only the one issue, I think we would be wrong. We should have a step-by-step -step approach. And uh, first I see and uh, where we could make a proof beyond all um, uh, accession talks which are going on uh, is how far we could uh, come to a joint security and foreign policy position. Uh, there is half is to be contributed from European Union side and half from Turkey. So we would see that uh, uh, Turkey has a very important role now these days with the Arabian Spring with those, uh, with the catastrophic situation in Syria, um, uh, to have more than an honest broker, more, uh, just have a consent with European positions and their position and um, uh, be uh, on the, the forefront uh, to try to implement those positions, diplomatically with other means, as we have to uh, and should talk about. I. Um, I see, and I thank you very much for your comment yesterday evening uh, at dinner, where we, uh, you, you, you commented, uh, if, I, if I may repeat, about um, um, Prime Minister Erdogan's uh, position about secular constitutions or not, in, or secular constitutions is, is uh, a challenge in, in Egypt and uh, in other uh, reform, should I say reform countries or countries changing very much. Um, uh, and and you, it, you, you, you gave us an insight how complicated this will be. I would say the only country of those uh, bearers of the same passport having made a sharp cut to secularism, this is uh, Turkey, this is Kemal Pasha Atatürk, and uh, all this what we learned as a secular-like 
cystic-like uh, uh, society. Uh, we see that uh, Turkey has, uh, due to the challenge of access to European integration, has done, under, done a lot of reforms. One of those um, was somehow the guarantee in, um, for seeing that uh, the secular approach will be kept. This was the domination of the general staff. We all said this won't fit into a democratic structure. Now they have changed and I think we should not blame them that they have changed. Uh, basically they have followed the requests of the uh, um, European and let me say transatlantic community um, and politics. So it's closer uh, and I would not see, remember that, um, see that um, some uh, let me say, uh, approaches to uh, religion, uh, we see in some uh, statesmen statesman in, in Turkey would be an indication that there is any tendency to um, uh, uh, re revoke and recall um, uh, the separation of um, state and religion. Uh, if I write the first who went to a Hajj was Turgut Özal, um, in the in the early 80s, there was a lot of discussion. But uh, since these times, I think um, basically uh, the freedom of uh, religion has um, reasonably well, if I may say, um, been managed. Uh, so this would be one of the rational reasons uh, which would not avoid to come. The rational reason where I would ask Turkey to have uh, not only uh, the honest broker role, but a real bridge role in the sense of reaching out um, in, in, into its neighborhood uh, in a consent with uh, Europeans and transatlantically, um, I uh, think it should be uh, somehow the, the moderation of the conflict uh, we see in the, in the Arabic uh, region, especially now in the next days. General Assembly of the United Nations when we have to talk about the day after the day after a decision probably being uh, uh, delivered or taken by the General Assembly of the United Nations. And so I have some concern having heard the voices uh, uh, from Turkey, Prime Minister Erdogan, I add also from uh, uh, Foreign Minister Avdor Lieberman, um, about uh, Turkish-Israeli relations. Um, uh, I think uh, we really have to work with all that uh, the key role Turkey can play um, in um, affording some perspectives of, um, um, uh, of developments, of peaceful developments in this region uh, should be reinstalled. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very important task Talking about uh, membership in European Union, um, first I would add, uh, I would add uh, the economic case. You, uh, you refer to energy, Nabucco. Absolutely, I think uh, uh, we do not take to, to uh, talk about everything. Also, this region has some experiences and uh, some political positions about how um, streams, streamlines uh, could uh, affect uh, political relations. So uh, uh, Nabucco, uh, which would be uh, somehow um, uh, has, would not have the need to take the Russian Federation as the key um, uh, uh, in energy supply um, and put Turkey in a very important role, I think is one of the key future uh, issues for European Union, European economy. And that European economy and Turkey closely are working together and going well um, has been a good, um, uh, already uh, said, I will, do not want to repeat, just uh, say that uh, this economic uh, cooperation will um, ask for closer political cooperation. Uh, if uh, this would be a full membership, I don't know whether uh, we are just uh, today see, I wouldn't say integrational overstretch of the European, of Europe of 27. But we see that what we all have said, uh, everything is done, 
and 27 and the agenda in Lisbon has made, probably we have to add some more things and reflect about uh, this what today already seems a challenge uh, to functionality of uh, European policies. Nevertheless, um, uh, Turkey is not only bridge, it's a partner, flank and uh, European friend. Thank you very much. I, if I may, I, I want to join this panel a little bit of the discussion, we, yesterday's panel about West, the Western involvement in mid the Middle East and North Africa. One of the words we heard in the panel yesterday was the word dignity. I think it was our Libyan colleague that used that word. And I was thinking, you know, last Monday at a meeting in Ankara, the, the Prime Minister, the Turkish Prime Minister's chief foreign policy advisor, used, had a very liberal use of the word justice. Uh, and it's interesting because these are words that are coming out uh, out of Turkey, when, even when it comes to the whole issue about the Palestinian recognition and relations with Israel. Uh, but they're also coming out of our partners to the south, justice, dignity, and all these terms. So as we are rethinking our policies towards this region, and this is where maybe Turkey can play an important role, how can we, more, how can we better define these terms? Because using them liberally also has its negative side. So is it something that maybe could also be used as we as Europeans, as Americans, uh, uh, the West is rethinking a little bit, it's, it's uh, adapting its, po its, its policies to what is happening to the South, and, and given Turkey's role there, how could we better uh, somehow work together in defining what needs to be done? Maybe you have an answer to this. Uh, I have an answer actually to this. And uh, I would like to connect this to another statement made either within NATO or within the EU. Whether Turkey is in line with the Western partners in everything that the Western, part, Western side of it is doing. My reaction to this uh, type of question is the following. Are we looking for a country, for a partner that says yes to everything that Europe says? Or a partner that could enrich their thinking by putting a new idea which is the reflection of looking at the same matter but from a different angle? If it is the second, that say if you want to enrich the portfolio of the Western thinking with the new ideas, with different perspectives, then Turkey's slightly different attitude from the European Union or NATO should be welcomed. Because the question of justice, dignity, etc., of course, we can use this, it, is, it could be stretched in either way, so you can define justice as, uh, whichever you, uh, way you want it. But uh, since Turk Turkish people and Turkish political leaders share a, a sort of mentality which is more common in the Middle East, this mentality may help the Western alliance or European Union to make a better assessment, more accurate assessment on what the expectations of the uh, countries of the Middle East uh, are. For instance, the question of uh, secularism that Erdogan mentioned uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, in Turkey, secularism is a sacrosanct uh, idea that cannot be touched. It's among the unamendable principles of the Constitution. This is how Turkey is. If there is a law in Turkey which is in contradiction with the secular system, then the Constitutional Court will overrule it. If when we turn to Egypt and uh, what is the equivalent constitutional principle there, Article 2 of the Egyptian Constitution says that no, no law in 
Egypt could be contrary to Sharia. In Turkey, the constitutionalism said that no law in Turkey could be based on religious basis. In Egypt, it says no law in Egypt can be based, uh, can contradict Sharia. You see, we are almost at different extremes. Turkey is in one extreme, Egypt in, is in another extreme. Despite this, Erdogan went there and praised secularism. And the Muslim Brotherhood movement, which was very much supportive of Erdogan's party, our party, the party I am founder of, for its attitude, started to say that Mr. Erdogan's statement must have been translated into Arabic in a wrong manner. He could not mean this. You see, it is to, to touch upon this question, or to put a stick in this beehive, which is religious, re religion or piousness and secularism, it's a very critical question. But Turkey, or its leader Erdogan, uh, demonstrated a leadership by putting the stick in the beehive and said, secular regime is the best, and it doesn't mean that people are deprived of their religion. On the contrary, it strengthens the religion. It is equidistant to Islam, Christianity, Jewish religion, and also, he said, to atheism. When you are so clear, if it is a Western European leader who says so in Egypt, it means less. But if it is said by a person who, is, who has a reputation of being a pious Muslim, when it is Erdogan who says it, it means something else. So this is what Turkey could bring as a contribution to bridge the gap, something that could not be done by others. But if Europe looks for a partner that forgets its identity and that it forgets its Middle Eastern identity or Middle Eastern uh, mentality and uh, turns to Europe and says everything that is, it should do should be exactly 100% like uh, Europe, this does not bring any benefit to the European Union nor to the Atlantic community. Thank you. You want to interject? Yes, well, uh, actually, um, this example very much reminded me of, um, in fact, a Baltic position within the European Union vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, let's say, so-called uh, Eastern Partnership countries or former uh, Soviet Union countries. Because when we are meeting uh, in uh, Caucasus, when we are meeting in Central Asia, we frequently uh, meet our political partners telling, listen, you in the Baltic countries, you have been with us together, you have been struggling so much for just approach while entering NATO and European Union. You can explain the rest of the West, actually, what is true and what is not true. So this, this is exactly what, what there is actually our, also our strategic partnership with Turkey. Because Turkey is doing very much now the same in that region well, what we can do uh, on behalf of NATO and European Union, either, either with our friends in Georgia, Azerbaijan, Central Asia, Uzbekistan, even Tajikistan, because um, it's not to brag, but these people will listen us much more than certain other politicians from other countries. And if I'm speaking about Central Asia, this is a region where actually our capabilities and interests overlap directly because Turkey has their interest and capability, and we have the interest and capability, okay? Sizes are different, but, but we can do the same job together. Uh, I know you two want to, briefly, because we have many questions. It, you it, it, um, just an example, a, a key point, but I think uh, this push, uh, position could, could be executed. And referring a little bit to, uh, to uh, Atis, uh, um, a comment about those uh, thinking this would be a Christian club, European Union. Um, NATO and the Europeans had fought one war to protect European Muslims against European Christians. 
this was the Kosovo War. It was nothing else than uh, a relation to a secular approach to the right of everybody to exist. Um, uh, and so I think this, uh, the message is, could be that uh, we Europeans learned that there's a necessity to give protection to minorities and to have a fair um, balance between uh, their rights and the rights of others. Um, uh, we just seeing in, in Egypt that uh, there's a lot of pressure uh, to the Copt Christian community uh, uh, which would absolutely not fit uh, to our understanding of, um, um, uh, of um, a democratic community and constitution. Um, the only country except Israel uh, with all its problems in its neighborhood, the only country in this, uh, extending in this region, which can give an example how it is. I, I know everybody could find some uh, examples which would, which would be Contact problematic it. if I think about how, to, but uh, including uh, the approach now how to deal with uh, the, the Kurdish issue that uh, there must be a clear message beyond secularism or not, there must be a respect of existence for all minorities and for, um, for, for all, uh, uh, this is the European message and somehow this is I think European model, model and uh, Turkey is part of this European model by constitution as you explained very much. So I, I could imagine this would be a good key note issue to everybody now thinking about how to form a new uh, society or constitution, what else. Uh, this would bring uh, Turkey and Europe uh, has there's a joint interest. Mr. Minister. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. Um, we'll make it extremely short. You know, we always tend to start theoretical debates about something which needs practical action. I absolutely hate, and I'm very sincere, to discuss the meaning of the word dignity, justice, and etc., remembering that the whole world missed, uh, missed the beginning and the reasons of uh, Arab uprising. And right now, nobody understands where that process is going on. So instead of, instead of discussing uh, uh, meaning, uh, meaning of dignity and justice, we better sit down and, and start counting the scenarios. The second important thing is that um, uh, we shall make a set of rules which apply to everybody. Uh, I agree with Christian that Kosovo population was in need to be defended. Now, do we apply the same rules to the north of Kosovo where Serbs doesn't want to live in an independent Kosovo or not? And do we apply the same rules to the Serbs in the, in the eastern part of Bosnia-Herzegovina? Might they decide to secede? and where that process is going to, to, to be stopped. And the third thing is that I absolutely agree with Minister. Uh, let's sit down and, and uh, let's sit down and discuss uh, what, w how we do understand partnership. Partnership between Turkey and the European Union, partnership between partner countries and the European Union, Artis is absolutely right. And uh, desire of the sovereign nations, which being setting example when it comes to economic development and democratic reforms, though not being perfect, to join, for example, NATO. And why? Uh, why some deny the same right to us, which was provided by Americans and the alliances to the same countries since 1949? Thank you. Well, I, I know I've seen at least four, four hands, and I know I can see five or six questions on the internet. So I'll start with Tengiz over there. Please introduce yourself. Uh, microphone is coming. Be brief, ask questions. I'll take two or three, and then we'll go for another round. Thank you, Dimitris. Tengiz Pchaladze, Center for Geopolitical Studies, Georgia. So, if everything uh, reduced to the common denomination, uh, we run to a voice question, question about future uh, cooperation. And it's more question, it's not question of religion, of course, it's more question of values. Uh, of course, we all have our history and memory and uh, our historical roots are quite deep and long and we remember, we all have black and white lists in our history. We all have uh, good and bad memory. We, remember Soviet Empire or, I don't know, 
Ottoman Empire or Byzantine Empire, and uh, we can go deeply and deeply, but main question today is what kind of values we are promoting and what kind of values we are ready to protect. And my question is, if today we are speaking about common values, uh, what is the main problem uh, in relationship between Turkey and EU? Because if we can find same language, uh, in this case, we can divide complex problem in uh, prime factors and factorial them. Yeah. So, what is the main problem uh, in relationship between EU and Turkey? Or how it looks from Turkey side and how it looks from EU side? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to the general here. Thank you, Klaus Wittmann, Aspen Institute, Germany. Uh, on three different notes, I have a quick remark, a question, and a proposal. Quick. The remark, I was uh, somewhat astounded that the new Turkish foreign policy devised by uh, Davut Toglu of strategic depth and zero problems did not play a role in any of the statements and uh, what results it has yielded so far. So that is only a remark. A precise question <coughs> to Minister Yakis. Can you explain Turkey's relationship with the Kurdish part, part of Iraq, and is that part of today's uh, subject, and a proposal on the very important uh, subject of EU-NATO relations that uh, State Secretary Schmidt uh, mentioned. What most people have forgotten or do not know is that Turkey was an associate member of the Western European Union. And when the WEU's security tasks were uh, shifted to the European Union, Turkey lost all that. I have sat through hours and hours of sessions at NATO headquarters when Turkey clamored to get back its WEU Aki, as they called it. And I think the European Union could make a very good offer on that basis to include Turkey much more in the GSDP. And finally, I would like to echo what you, Minister, said we should more, we should less preach to Turkey and more listen to it. Thank you. And the gentleman there. I'll get you the next one. Thank you. I'm uh, Karl Kovanda, an independent um, consultant from Brussels. Uh, Minister Yakish drew his circle around Istanbul, and there was one country which he did not include, and where Turkey has been trying to be, be a bridge, and where Turkey has had a slightly different view when, than Europe, and that's Iran. And maybe you could elaborate a little bit on how you evaluate the results of the Turkish-Brazilian efforts with Iran. Is it dead? Was it a dead end? Or is something going on? And how do you evaluate the reaction that that met with in um, the rest of the West? Thank you. Well, maybe I'll give the floor to you. Minister Yakish, you want to start? Thank you very much. Regarding the uh, question of our uh, Georgian friend, what is the main problem uh, between Turkey and EU? I think it cannot be reduced to one single problem. Uh, France and the Germany has forgotten what happened during the Second World War, that's to say 60 years ago, but many European Union countries do not forget what happened in 1683 when Turks besieged Vienna. Still they are stuck there and they say, you Turks, you came all to the heart of uh, Europe and besieged Vienna. So if things that happened 60 years ago could be forgotten, I presume that uh, what happened uh, 350 years ago should, could also be uh, forgotten. <coughs> this is one aspect of it. Secondly, uh, despite the fact that we try to ignore it and marginalize it, cultural difference, which is based on religion, is still there. And 9-11 attack in uh, uh, New York, plus the, the book by Huntington, Clash of the Civilization, added uh, pepper and salt to the wound, to the wound between uh, Islam and the West. So it made it easier for those who wanted to look uh, for a substitute of uh, Russian uh, enmity or mm -hmm. differences between East and West, 
with something that could substitute it, and Islam was an excellent uh, uh, element that could be used as it. This is also another uh, element. Uh, then the size of Turkey, population-wise and the strategic importance-wise, makes uh, certain countries uh, reluctant because if Turkey comes to the European Union, in the European Parliament, they will have the highest number of seats, uh, then it's a problem. The, the answer to this question is that why, when Germany has the highest number of seats in the European Parliament, and with economic might, it doesn't cause a problem? But when it is Turkey that has the highest seat, but which is not comparable with Germany in its economic might is causing a problem. So there are subjective sides, as His Excellency the Minister says uh, to Turkey's approach, there are objective side and the rational side. So it's a compound, it's very uh, complicated. It's not, it could not be uh, reduced to one single uh, problem. The uh, question of the strategic depth uh, and the zero problem of Davutoglu, uh, zero problem is a target, is an ideal that you want to reach. Can you reach it? It's not, it doesn't depend only on you. It should depend on the other side. I mean, there should be a willingness, at least to demonstrate that you want to, uh, uh, to achieve this idea. If it is reciprocated, if this effort is reciprocated by the other side, then you can achieve this. Davutoglu wrote his book, Strategic Depth, when he was an academician. I served in diplomacy for 40 years. Of course, when you go to the field, it's easier to write a book. You lock yourself up in between four walls, and you develop your theory by picking up the most interesting and easy way of doing, doing it. But when you go afield and uh, meet with the resistance of a, of a minute state, I mean, which has no importance, and if it, that country says no, for an irrational reason, you cannot overcome this difficulty. So writing book is very important to develop the ideas. In implementing, you may not be as successful as you developed your idea in your book. Now, Davudol is trying to uh, use uh, or unearth the potentials of Turkey. To what extent he is going to be successful? Time will show. Most probably we will fail in some things that we are doing. We may be successful in some others, but we will try to make the most of it. And on the Kurdish issue, uh, when we were about to establish the present ruler, ruling party in Turkey, I was deputy chairman of the party in charge of international relations. And uh, uh, Gül was the uh, deputy chairman for political affairs. I went to him one day when the then Minister of Defense from a coalition government was saying that in the north of Iraq they are seeking for autonomy, L let them s uh, get this autonomy and we will see whether they will be able to achieve it. I went to uh, Gül and said that, look, if we come to power one day, we should avoid this type of statement because we have only a limited control on what is going to happen within the Iraqi territory. It's their country. And uh, if they get autonomy and even independence in the future, Turkey will have to live with this independent Iraqi Kurdistan as a neighbor forever. So we should not burn the ships in our relations. He said, but can you make this change in Turkish policy when things are unfolding with such a speed? I said, no, because I mean, the 
the uh, United States was going to invade Iraq, and it was very hot, and everything was going very fast. Then the elections took place. He became prime minister, and I became foreign minister. He called me one day. He said, Yashar, do you remember you told me this and that regarding north of Iraq? You are now foreign minister. Can you do it now? Can you change this policy into a friendship? I said, no, the things are unfolding more quickly now, but this should remain our target. <coughs> and uh, fortunately, this target has now been achieved to a certain extent. We have very good relations with the Iraqi Kurds, northern Iraqi Kurds, and uh, perhaps autonomy is almost there, and uh, we will continue these good relations uh, in the future. On the question of Western European Union and the uh, European Defense Agency, this is one of the most uh, unfortunate episodes of our relations with NATO and uh, with the European Union, because one member of the European Union with the 700,000 people population objects Turkey's presence and objects the idea that you are uh, saying that they to keep the aki that Turkey obtained in the Western European Union in the new structure. But there is opposition because of one single country. And I hope that the opposition of that single country will be avoided. Relations between Iran and Turkey and what it has done with, is, uh, uh, with uh, Brazil, Turkey acted at that time to moderate Iran's uh, attitude and to put down in a, in a text what Iran should be doing in cooperation and in full consultation with the United States. We told them, we informed the United States from every stage of uh, our negotiations with Iran. And we told them, we, we have only, the West in general, and international community has only limited means to stop Iran from continuing this. We should do it with their own with their own consent. And this is how we invited Iran to the negotiating table and uh, set a framework saying that Iran will give to the Western, to the Vienna Club, uh, the uranium enriched up to uh, 12%, and will receive in exchange of this uranium enriched to 21, 22%, which is necessary for the scientific and the, and the medical purposes, and stop there, not to continue to 90, 95% enrichment, which is weapon-grade enrichment. Because Turkey is the country which will be affected, the most affected, if Iran reaches, becomes a nuclear uh, weapons degree uh, nuclear capability. Apart from Israel, it is Turkey which is closest to it, and the, the balance in the Middle East will, sh sh will, dif will be upset, so Turkey will be affected from this. So Turkey was directly in, uh, involved and more interested, and this is why Turkey was doing this. Did we achieve where it stands now? Well, we have achieved, we have done whatever we could, and we are not master of the world and uh, control everything that uh, goes on. But at that time, we believe that together with Brazil, we have done what was the most appropriate at that time. Thank you. Uh, again, shortly, uh, Dimitri, for the gentleman from Germany. Uh, I've been speaking about uh, zero problems with neighbor policy in action when it comes to Georgia. Uh, it's a process, ongoing process. Uh, it, it's very successful when it comes to Georgia and Turkey. It failed miserably when it comes to Armenia. And we are we are unfortunately we are one of those who do regret that very much because opening armenian turkish border would have meant uh, taking out armenia at least partially from russia's military influence didn't happen but uh, you cannot accuse uh, ahmed uh, not being sincere they are trying thank you
anybody else? Very briefly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just to 1683 and the Polish presidency these days, uh, uh, I do not see a, um, a, a connection. They did not uh, put it under the name of Jan Sobieski. <laughs> um, but um, uh, nevertheless, it was a part of, indeed, of European identity. Uh, after these, uh, just to crib a little bit in history, uh, what you, uh, I, I was um, impressed uh, hearing your um, explanation of the development of relations. Uh, Germans are just referring to um, uh, the famous visit of the German Emperor Wilhelm II, I think in 1902 to the um, Supreme Court, and uh, a lot of cooperation, including the Baghdad Railway, uh, coming out of this um, um, uh, cooperation, and uh, not not to forget Lehman von Sanders uh, in this context. Um, not everybody liked him, and uh, von der Gold's Pasha, um, uh, who supported uh, the Young Turks uh, in in the approach to create um, a post uh, Ottoman um, uh, Turkey. So I think there are a lot of historical relations we can also. Uh, put on the problems, uh, um, I, I, I share all uh, your, your, your comments and, and uh, especially your comment about uh, European Union member states and how they should um, think about step-by-step uh, -step approach and not stop everything. Um, European, Western European Union uh, uh, association is not the only European uh, uh, Turkey is associated to European Union uh, if I may say I was one of those uh, being on those on the side of those fighting in the uh, for the European Parliament to get a majority vote because uh, it was not that easy due to human rights situation in these days to get uh, seen by, by 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 the left now we here we are what we did not achieve is that we agreed on a step-by-step -step approach because uh, um, it was discredited uh, on Turkish side, if I'm right. Remember uh, some talks to Mesut Yilmaz uh, that there was a suspicion this would be just uh, only uh, 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 to give something to be quiet. I do not see that there could be, without an overstretch, a development to full membership now. This does not say that we could not have a closer, I don't know whether you should, uh, could, can use the word partial membership or whatever, uh, uh, in s areas of uh, a joint responsibility, including security and defense. So this is where we could and should come back uh, to, to your um, um, uh, comment on Western European Union. I'm, uh, uh, I think there is a a need from, from both sides. It's not only to offer something to Turkey. We need Turkey in, in, in this context. Okay, uh, we are running out of time. It's, we have about 12 to 15 minutes and we have a number of questions. Um, I, I, there are about six of them on the internet. I'll ask two of them. So they're questions, not comments. One, and I think the, the Young Diplomacy Professionals Forum has been very active in, in us sending questions. Can the EU make a bridge to Asia without Turkey? Some of it we've addressed, but this is a question. Can, to, to can, can the EU make a bridge to, a to Asia without Turkey? Uh, another one, uh, which is interesting too, uh, isn't one of the reasons why Turkey is now trying to settle the Middle East in the Middle East. Uh, that the, one of the reasons for that, for Turkey's involvement in the Middle East, has to do with the EU rejecting Turkey for almost 60 years now. So that is a question. Is there a correlation there? And uh, the third one I will take from these six is how could the current relationship between uh, Turkey and Cyprus affect the future of the accession of Turkey? Which is a topic, <laughs> a hot topic. And I'll also give the floor to you, sir. Thank you. I think that Minister Jakis had Please introduce yourself. Oh, oh sorry. Olaf Erin Kronan, Senior Advisor to the Swedish Foreign Minister. Uh, I think Mr. Minister Jakis had a, a very good point uh, about um, Prime Minister Erdogan uh, addressing the, the issue of secularism in Cairo. And I think that, of course, one of the crucial points in, in the modernization of, of, of the Arab world is the issue of secularization. But I also think it's important to, to 
recognize that there are two models of secularization in the Western world. We have the American mo model and we have the French model. And Turkey very much has adopted the French model from historical reasons, which is a top-down model, which is an imposed secularism by the state, compared to the US model, which is a bottom-up model, which um, uh, makes the state not taking side in religious matter, having a state neutrality with regard to and you can see it very uh, clearly in the French legislation against headscarves or niqab or, or burqas. And now we, with the de uh, discussion we have now in France we, we, with the uh, possibility of being, uh, having prayers on the streets. And the difference in the US where you have a strong religious society while you still have a, a very secular state. And I think it's important uh, when Turkey is now having its de this, uh, debate about the constitution, that the change of constitution from a state-oriented constitution to a constitution based on civil and individual liberties is a very, very important part of combining secularism with the possibility of religious freedom for the people. And I think that is, to a certain extent, one of the key issues if we are going to, to reach out to the Arab world in these matters. That's a remark. Then I have a question to my German friend. Uh, one of the reasons why Erdogan is so dissatisfied with the European attitudes is the CSU blockade of, uh, or, or, of upgrading the membership of the AK party in the EPP. Would it be possible, do you think, that CSU could have a more constructive attitude towards the AK party within the framework of EPP? Because this would, of course, as I see it, very much change the psychological climate in the relations between the EU and Turkey, uh, regardless of the different opinions with the, uh, uh, about the future membership. Um, Thirdly, I would say I think it's a bit difficult to say to the Turks, we need you for the defense, we need you for the southern flank, but we are not prepared to give you any political influence. I don't think that is a really a fair deal. Thank you. Well, if you could briefly answer and then we'll maybe take, I know I have a couple more questions there. So, sir? Oh, yes, very briefly. I, I, don't, I think that the question, can we uh, manage without Turkey, is a misleading question. We can manage many things without somebody, but it would be wrong to uh, do it without the available resources. And uh, as far as, for instance, uh, the accession talks as far as the inclusion of, of um, uh, European Defense Agency of Turkey and etc. I actually think that this is, uh, maybe it's not 100% politically correct, but I think we could not afford for eternal time to be a hostage of very small minority opinion if it is uh, touching upon the issues of all the European Union and all the NATO. I, I think the cost is a little bit too high. We have to find the way. Of course, we have to find some kind of compromise to move further. Uh, regarding the question again that His Excellency the Minister referred to, that's to say, can Turkey make a bridge without Turkey with uh, Asia? Uh, Clemenceau, uh, the French president, used to say, les cimetières sont pleins de gens qui se croyaient indispensables. The cemeteries are full of people who thought that they were indispensable. Uh, when we apply it to the international arena, as His Excellency the Minister said, everything could be done without the cooperation with other countries. But uh, I will use not a Turkish assessment, but the, the assessment of French President Jacques Chirac, who said in the year 2004, a few days before the 2004 European summit, I quote him, he said, if the European Union contemplates to become a free trade area, we could do it without Turkey. But if the European Union wants to assume global responsibilities, we cannot do it without Turkey. Who says this? Is it a Turk? No. Is the French in the street, a man in the street in front? No. 
It is the president of the Republic of France, the predecessor of His Excellency Sarkozy. So perceptions may also evolve throughout the age when the time change. So uh, I will repeat something that I said at the beginning. European Union and the West in general could do anything that it wants in any area of the world. But by cooperating with Turkey, it could do it easier, That's with right. muscle efforts, more effectively, and with uh, much less acrimony. Turkey is prepared to do it, but what Turkey has done could do has a limit. Turkey could bring the horse to the river, but it cannot force it to drink. How Cyprus affects the uh, uh, accession process? In Turkey, there is a widespread perception that Cyprus has nothing to do with Turkey's European Union accession process. It is an excuse used by certain European leaders to hide behind, not to be exposed to the Turkey's uh, criticism. Why so? Because if there is a political will in the mind of, the, of those leaders in the European Union to admit Turkey, they can twist the arm of any country. They have done it with a country with 40 million inhabitants it's like Poland. Poland. And they can twist the arm, they could do it. This is in case there is a political will in their mind. If there is no political will in their mind, even if Turkey gives Cyprus away free of charge, if Turkey says, I don't want Cyprus, do whatever you want with it, it will not become a member again. So Cyprus question is only an excuse that certain European Union countries use to hide behind. It is not the real problem. And uh, does it mean that Turkey should leave the Cyprus question unsolved? No. Turkey should solve this problem, but within its own parameters. In other words, Turkey doesn't want to be told that if you don't do the this and that on the Cyprus question, no way for the European Union. Turkey wouldn't accept this. Turkey wants to be a member of the European Union with the same conditions as the other countries, that to say when it fulfills the uh, Copenhagen criteria, it should become a member. Cyprus was admitted to the European Union without solving its problem with Turkey. Why Turkey would not be able to join without solving its problem with Cyprus? So it should be worked in both ways. French secularism is very interesting. I will say even something further. Turkey opted for French secularism but a British author was referring, was characterizing Turkish secularism as, a, as, a, as militant secularism. Unlike in France, it is the state in Turkey that says how you are going to become secular. And unlike in many secular countries, the bishops or imams in Turkey are public servants. They are appointed by the state. And the, on the Friday prayers, it is the state, the Religious Affairs Directorate, that drafts the texts that imams will read out after the uh, Friday prayers. <coughs> this type of secularism does not exist in other parts of the world. And uh, I know uh, Mr. Erdogan's approach. He is more inclined to adopt the type of secularism either in America or in Britain, but it's a question of culture. If you set the sectarian groups free, they may turn Turkey into something different. This question surfaces or presents itself differently in, in Turkey than it is in the European countries. If in Hyde Park, a young British man comes and says, I am an admirer of Hitler, I wish that he lived until now, and I wish that there is another Hitler in Britain, people will laugh at him and forget. If same thing happens in Germany, it's a danger. 
So, if secularism is implemented like in uh, America and in, in Britain, in Turkey, then it becomes something else. So, we should be aware of this difference. So the, a question that is addressed to you, I have a comment on this question because I was in charge of running the relations between Turkey and the EPP. Turkey has observer status within the EPP and wants to upgrade this to the associate membership status. And Her Excellency Angela Merkel told us that her CSU partner told him, if I accept this, how can I explain this to Bavarian uh, voters? I thought by myself that I wish I could find one single Bavarian who knows the difference of upgrading AKP party from observer status to the uh, associate member status. So it's, uh, Here I am. <laughs> Briefly, please, <laughs> as we are running out of Thank time. You. It's very interesting <laughs> hearing what um, um, uh, my boss, she was, what, what, she, uh, what she tells on a level of party level. But uh, to our Swedish uh, uh, friend, um, I remember very well these times when we had, uh, on, sorry for those not affiliated to uh, uh, European People's Party history, the EDU, European Democratic Union, which had a lot of reasonability, including getting these British guys um, uh, in, in the boat. Now, they are also off the boat. I would like if they would apply to get uh, um, uh, associated status, but uh, David Cameron not yet had, uh, has uh, uh, asked to for it. This was a time when, um, um, with all respect uh, of AKP, the Motherland Party of Mesut Yilmaz, Mesut Yilmaz, chaired as deputy president uh, of, of, of uh, this uh, organization. So I think uh, this, um, uh, uh, there, there is a membership for, um, um, say, a non, um, I, no, you got me, <laughs> uh, an association, but an um, uh, observer status. Uh, those, for those um, member uh, states of uh, European uh, Council of Europe, um, and not of uh, European Union. So I think uh, we will continue talking this, and uh, uh, with your respect um, and uh, acceptance, I take home um, probably there are some um, explanations to be given to uh, the uh, uh, chairman of CDU. Um, nevertheless, uh, we are, uh, I think we uh, stay in the same family, and this is what the message is, and uh, in due time, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel will have a meeting with uh, Prime Minister Erdogan uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, there is a, the place to talk about in this CSU is, uh, how, how did you say, uh, um, you do not want to come and uh, just to share the positions of others, um, um, uh, sometimes putting new ideas in, so we, we feel as, uh, but not in a sense that we do not see that there's a, a necessity to have uh, uh, good relations uh, to Turkish parties, to the dominating party in these times, from dominating party to dominating party. Minister Vashaji, you want to ask this? Okay, uh, I'll take two questions and then give the floor to the panelists for the last. Marcin, please introduce yourself here. Uh, Marcin Zaborowski, Polish Institute for International Affairs. Uh, no comments on Vienna or Sobieski, so no worries. Uh, it will be very short. I have a question to Minister Yakis um, about the uh, recent tension in uh, Turkish-Israeli relations. We have heard decision about uh, the possible uh, escort, military escort to the flotilla, humanitarian flotilla um, that will be going to Gaza. That naturally means that there is a potential for conflict. Uh, and that potential for conflict may involve NATO. Uh, so I would like to hear your, um, your comments on that. All right, and, and the last question to Billion over there. Mm, 
My name is Bilgin Özkan. I'm from Turkish Embassy. My question goes to representative of Germany. So I was uh, very much uh, flattered with your reference to Turkey as a partner, flank country, and European friend. And my question about the European Defense Agency. It is an agency designed to actually improve military and defense capability of Europe. And Turkey is willing to join this agency. And actually, it has been part of the European defense uh, architecture. It's a member of NATO and the largest contributor of EU operations as non-EU member. But still, it is at the door. So you have mentioned that uh, Turkey-EU relations should be a step-by-step -step approach. And you summarized what we should do at home, how we treat about our minorities, about the freedom of religions, some of them. You have really good points. That's correct. But you haven't mentioned anything about what will you do when you go back home to influence your parliament and to influence your Minister of Defense. OK. Well, uh, we are really running short of time. The organizers are threatening to shoot me. So uh, very short answers. Who wants to respond? I, I, I should <laughs> just say I, I have nothing to add to the comments uh, Artis Papax made about uh, European Defense Agency. And uh, I have not to add anything about the comments was made about uh, the role of Cyprus. Um, uh, in, in some context. I, uh, you're a diplomat, I'm not a diplomat, but now I draw the diplomatic um, um, card and would say I think uh, the message is clear. <laughs> <laughs> Minister uh, On the Turkish-Israel relations, this is a chapter of our recent history that none of us is pleased with and uh, Turkey and Israel are the only two countries in the region that are run with, the de de uh, with a democratic regime. They need each other, and they are doomed to live uh, together in the region, and uh, the uh, problem has to be solved one way or another. Uh, there were perhaps ways of preventing the r recent uh, retreating relations between Turkey and Israel, first of all by advising the flotilla to sail to uh, Israel, and if the Turkish government, of course, cannot stop a civil society organization to take action, but then Turkey could have advised them to go to El Arish and ship the humanitarian aid through there, if it not worked that way, then cooperate with the Israeli authorities to deliver these things after being checked by the Israeli authorities, whether it contains uh, ammunition and that type of things. These were not d done, it could have been done, and, and the, the clash could have been avoided, but none of these absence of these things would justify the attack on a civilian ship by the army uh, contingents in the open sea uh, on a Turkish uh, flotilla on the civilians and killing nine persons. In the international law, those who are familiar with international law would know that this is piracy full stop. Nothing more, nothing less. So. Israeli authorities committed the crime of piracy, and Turkey asked apology for this. And uh, it is still waiting. But the present composition of the Israeli coalition government doesn't allow this because of the domestic balances, which we have to understand because it also counts. <coughs> and uh, we hope that one way or another, these two countries who have a very long history of friendship, you may remember that Ottoman Empire was the country that welcomed Jews, Sephardim Jews, when they were expelled from Granada in 1492. And they spread all over the Ottoman geography. So we have, uh, we have celebrated uh, a few decades ago the fifth 
100th anniversary of Jews, Sephardim Jews' arrival in the Ottoman Empire. So this history is very long. When there is such a long history behind, I hope that the problem will be overcome sooner or later. And the, uh, the escort of military, the statement of uh, the Prime Minister, I don't think that he meant an escort within the uh, territorial waters of uh, Israel. Escort in the open sea, well, it's only natural that in the open sea belongs to all countries. Either you escort or not, it's up to you. But escort is not a provocative action when it is done in the open seas, in the high seas. And I don't think that Turkey uh, plans or contemplates to escort it within the uh, territorial water, so there will not be any problem. And the potential of conflict for NATO, I don't think that it is uh, likely. Yeah. One okay. sentence, but no. the qualification of um, uh, the Israeli approach um, uh, you, you gave does not, um, um, is not aligned with the report to the Security Council of the United Nations. There was uh, quite another uh, qualification about this, uh, so I will not continue, but just add, I think there's a lot of things to, be well, uh, to discuss. Well, I'm, I'm already a dead man, so uh, I apologize for the other two panelists. I'm getting pressured, even though you're the host, you know, we could go on forever, right? But uh, I apologize uh, to the other two panelists for not giving them the word. We're putting an end to this very, very interesting session. We could go on talking, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, I thank the speakers very much and uh, we should all thank them for their... <laughs>